Welcome everyone to our webinar, a Practical Intro to Generative AI. I'm Beth Ann uh, in marketing at Continual. Um, you know, since you're here, you're probably like us, you're really excited about um, how the AI landscape is changing and some of these new uh, generative models like uh, GPT-3, Stable Diffusion. Um, so in this session, we're going to uh, give a great kind of hands-on practical learning intro um, to how these models are different, how they work, how you build things with them, um, get tips and tricks, and kind of some uh, deeper insight in, into some of the technical considerations that you'll that you want to be aware of as you uh, start out to to start building these technologies into product experiences. A um, couple quick things: uh, you should see a Q and A uh, button on your Zoom panel where you can submit questions throughout and we will uh, have time for those at the end. And uh, you will get access to the recording um, in, in an email and follow up to the event. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to Tristan Zions. He's the CEO and co-founder of Continual to uh, get us started. So hey, everybody out there. Uh, thank you for taking the hour to, to join us here and talk a little bit about probably one of the most exciting things that's happening, probably the most exciting thing that's happening uh, in, the, in the AI machine learning world, which is the incredible rise and, uh, of, of generative AI over the last six months, um, building upon you know, a set of innovations that have happened over the, maybe the last uh, five or six years. Um, I'm like you out there, uh, somebody who's incredibly excited about, about what's going on, what it enables in terms of capabilities, uh, how it enables both uh, new products to be built, uh, new types of users to build uh, these products. Uh, maybe you don't even need to be a machine learning expert uh, to really leverage some of these things. And so today's webinar is really about uh, sharing some of the lessons that we've learned at Continual as we explored that, that area. I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, continual today, but we are exploring how does generative AI affect uh, both uh, individual machine learning uh, engineers and, and product developers, how does, does their world change, uh, and how do the, all of our products change, the products that, that we build at Continual, how can we leverage this capability, and how can we also potentially help others uh, to, to, to leverage these, these emerging capabilities. So today, it's going to be super hands-on, hopefully a little bit of, hopefully have a little bit of fun, uh, talk about um, uh, 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 talk about uh, the, both the research, uh, show you a little bit of sort of applied applied work, um, uh, toy examples, and give you an intuition for uh, the space, uh, where it is today, where it's going, uh, and what are some of the exciting ideas or considerations, uh, you know, in, in this area. So with that, um, I've covered this a little bit. Uh, today's agenda is, is pretty straightforward. What is generative AI? Uh, I, I think probably many of you out there uh, have been tracking this and you're signing up for this web, web, webinar, but perhaps not everybody. Uh, and so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of an overview for what is generative AI, uh, how it works, um, what exactly is going on behind the scenes so that you gain some in intuition uh, and it's not all just uh, a magic. Talk very briefly about sort of what I think makes it new and different and exciting. Um, and then kind of dive into the heart uh, of, of this the presentation where, where I'm going to dive deep into some of the challenges that still exist and the workarounds or sort of tips and tricks uh, that are out there uh, in the literature that you know, we've experimented with and found some success with. And some of the pros and cons, you know, as you're thinking about uh, different ways to sort of get the most out of these models, uh, the different paths, there's many different paths you can go down to. And again, Hopefully, at the end, you'll have some intuition around, you know, where maybe you shouldn't spend a lot of your time, or maybe where, you know, you should spend your time, uh, uh, and, and, and maybe come up with your own ideas. I think one of the exciting things about this space, actually, is that it's so new that once you start to develop an intuition, um, it, it's relatively easy to have uh, sort of your own ideas uh, that, can act, uh, that can actually be quite impactful for your applications. Talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, I, what we've perceived, you know, talking to both looking internally, but also look, talking to uh, customers about what are some promising product areas, how you can actually leverage this uh, technology in your individual uh, domains. Uh, and then if there's time, um, save a few minutes uh, for questions and answering uh, answers, um, uh, since I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll be some. All right, so let's dive in. So what is generative AI? Um, rather than having me describe it to you, um, why don't I just uh, uh, ask a generative AI system uh, what generative AI is, and we can see how it works and see what it says. So one of the most uh, popular generative AI systems out there, which I'm sure everybody has heard about now in the last two or three months, uh, it seems to be at every cocktail conversation, 
is, is, around, uh, is around what's going on with ChatGPT. So ChatGPT is a, is a dialogue-oriented generative system. Dialogue orientation is not the only way these models work, um, as I'll talk about in a little bit, but dialogue uh, systems have turned out to make these generative models much more accessible to the average person. Um, and I think that's really sort of penetrated the public's consciousness as a result. So let's just ask ChatGPT, what is generative AI? And see what it says. So first of all, you can see something is being generated. So it says, what I say, what is generative AI? And, and ChatGPT says, generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that is capable of generating new data. That sounds right. Or content such as images, okay, text, music, uh, and other forms of creative output. So that's all matches my intuition. I would say probably most some of the most exciting work uh, or the most mature work is probably with respect to text. Uh, that's what you're seeing here. Uh, maybe the next bit of work, next type of generative uh, capability that we have is around images, so things like DALI and stable diffusion. But there's emerging forms um, around things like movies, music, voice, uh, you know, three-dimensional uh, Im imagery. So to continue on, it says, let's see, unlike other types of AI that are focused on classification or prediction, generative AI models are designed to create new data that is similar to the data that they were trained on. So this is true, but I think in some ways it under, understates the power of generative AI. So although it's not focused on classification or prediction, as you'll see, it can be used for classification and prediction, right? So if you have, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you that in a, in a little bit. Um, and it generates data, uh, creates new data that is similar to the data that it was trained on. Uh, that is true at the most fundamental level, well, as we'll learn how these models are trained. It's fundamentally trained to kind of mimic what uh, the data that has been trained on. But actually, a lot of the work over the last year changes that dynamic a little bit. Uh, and so it's not just to, uh, to generate data similar to the data that it's trained on, which might be, for instance, the whole World Wide Web. It actually can be trained to generate data that is aligned with our goals and our preferences, right? And so, actually, ChatGPT is a system that was trained with more than uh, sort of just uh, just mimicry. Um, goes on and on here. And I won't I won't read any more. Um, but uh, that kind of gives you a, a sense of, of what generative AI uh, is at a very very high level. So, okay, that is at a very high level. But um, it's hard to understand how does that actually work. Um, and so one thing that we can do is a bit, that was uh, ChatGPT from OpenAI. Uh, OpenAI is one of the leading providers of these large uh, generative models or large foundation models, large language models. Kind of, you can use those terms somewhat interchangeably. Um, and behind, Ch although the ChatGPT uh, inter uh, API is not available, they do have an API available for their underlying model that, that ChatGPT is a specialization of. And you can actually get to understand a little bit about how ChatGPT3 work, ChatGPT works by playing around with their underlying model. So imagine we wanted to create a lightweight version of ChatGPT, maybe for your product, you wanted to create a, a chatbot, maybe ChatGPT's interface API is not out there yet. Well, it's actually not that hard to do. So if I jump into the ChatGPT interface here, um, at, the at the very lowest level, these, these, these generative models are completion models, um, or at least these, the, the, this, this, this API, as there's also an edit API here, which, which I won't talk about today. But in general, these, these models work by inputting a prompt. Um, a prompt is a sort of a sequence of text that starts your, uh, that, 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 that starts your, your body of text, and then this, these AIs can complete that text. Um, there's some subtlety here in terms of how it completes it. Um, but let's putting that aside, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, let's just imagine that we wanted to build a chatbot. So one way to build a chatbot is to say, imagine you are a chatbot. Um, you should respond in a helpful and harmless way to a custom to a human's questions. Uh, human. Okay. Then we could say something like what is generative, just to mimic this example. And then I'm gonna go AI. Now, this is kind of a prompt. You could think of this as an instruction, right? And it's trying to, it's trying to put this underlying model in the right frame of mind, if you will, to know, given that it then says human, there's some text that says human, it says, what is generative AI? What do you think 
AI colon, what do you think would follow that? You can probably think of much better examples here. Like maybe you should, you know, give an example, like uh, example, you know, something AI, uh, human, uh, who, uh, who is the president of the United States? This might help it understand what I'm asking it for, Joe Biden. And then I might say something like this, okay? This is my prompt. We have total control over what we wanna do here. And here is uh, my input. This is still part of my prompt and we're now asking for a completion. So if I run uh, submit here, we can see that it now is completing that text with text that it views as likely uh, uh, to lead up, likely to follow this uh, input. And it says generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that works by creating a new, creating new data from existing data. It is often used in image processing, natural language processing, artificial creativity applications. All right, pretty good. Maybe not quite as good as, um, as what we had over here. This was a very nice response for a dialogue, but a pretty good system. We could say, we could follow up and say, human, you know, can you explain in more depth? AI, submit. Sure, and it will go on. It will now explain more and more and more. And you can see quickly here that just from this, this API is very simple. All you do is pass in a, a, a prefix, an input prompt, uh, and then ask it to complete it. If you're clever about the way you do that prompting, you can build a dialogue application. And that's that's one application that's that's mimicking this chat GPT application, but it's not, not the only one. All right, so that gives a little bit of a feel for, hey, even now, you should say, ah, I could, if I wanted to build a chat, uh, in, uh, chat interface to my product, um, if that's the right modality for, for the feature that you want to build. Um, and all you really need to do is use this underlying text completion API. Um, really, I think the power is to think about how many different applications can you uh, frame in this particular way. But so, so that kind of gives you a sense of, of how uh, uh, chat GPT was built, leaving out a bunch of details, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a second. So, okay, that was still just showing you APIs, showing you some websites. If you're a machine learning person or you wanna really understand things that doesn't give you a, a ton of intuition. So how did this really work, right? How was this really done? Let's dive a little bit deeper into that. So the, probably the seminal paper that came out uh, on this, you know, there's a se sequence of them, but one was this language models are few shot learners. And so what does that mean? Uh, few shot learners, what exactly that means? So here, this is a paper from OpenAI. And well, you know, rather than, uh, you know, tell you and summarize it myself, let me actually go and look at this, uh, grab this, it's too long of an abstract to read. And so let me actually say something like, oops, what just happened here? Sorry, I just, oh, there it goes. Um, my, my, sorry, my browser switched around on me. Um, so let me actually go and say uh, the following, or actually I'll just do it in the playground so it's not quite as magical. And, and I'll say something like, summarize the following uh, paper abstract. And then I'll say something like this. Let me grab the text there. I'll maybe say in three bullets. And I'll say summary. And I'll click submit. And you can see what I'm actually doing here is I'm building a summarization use case. So a second ago, I built a chat use case on this API. And here I said, hey, I've got some text. I want to build a summary of it. Um, and you know, an abstract is already a summary, but I could potentially do this with the, you know, the entire document. Um, and so in this particular case, or I might want to build a smart, uh, you know, uh, I want to do this automatically within my uh, presentation software. So I can just go over to my presentation software, you know, and if I wanted to, I could just add it right here as, as my bullet points. Um, let me just click on it and read these, read the summaries. So the summary says chat GPT is a 175 billion parameter language model. So first, very large, okay. Demonstrate strong performance on many NLP tasks with a few shot dem with few shot demonstrations specified purely by text interaction. And so we'll talk. I'll, I'll, I'll show show what that means in a second. GPT three struggles with certain types of data sets and can generate news articles that are but uh, 
struggles with some data sets, but generates news articles that are indistinguishable from those written by humans. So in some areas, there's still some weaknesses, which we'll talk about, and other areas, it's extremely strong, such as generating news, uh, news uh, articles. Of course, you know, they're talking also about the broader implications uh, for society, disinformation, uh, you know, information retrieval, all the different positive and potential negative uh, uh, use cases. All right, so this is this big, there's a few uh, points came out in here. One is trained a very large model. And so to understand that a little bit, to change a very large model, you need a lot of data. To generate, to get a lot of data, it's often hard to generate labels. So we have a, data, a traditional machine learning often has a set of inputs, a set of labels, you know, classification, and we train a model to, for given these inputs, to try to have a good uh, accuracy on predicting uh, those underlying labels. These large foundation models are trained at the core um, with, in a self-supervised way. And there's many different approaches to self-supervision, but the core idea behind self-supervision is can we use a huge amount of unlabeled data, for instance, the World Wide Web or uh, you know, all the books that are out there or transcripts of YouTube videos, um, a huge amount of data. Can we train on that data and can we set some objective that out of that objective, uh, uh, this model learns these general capabilities if it gets big, big enough. And so in the case of chat, uh, or the case of GPT, uh, that objective is really a next word prediction. So given a set of text, can we predict the next word? Um, this, this, in this particular uh, illustration, which is a, a more newer paper called UL2 from Google, which is showing different potential objectives that you can have, these what are called denoising objectives. Um, uh, but the general idea is, can you predict the ne next word? This particular paper, which is more recent than the original GPT paper, uh, finds that actually having a few different types of these denoising objective benefits and actually leads to uh, significantly increased performance. And so in this case, uh, these, these types of self-supervised objectives are things like filling in the blank of a word, completing a, a sentence. So not only one word, but completing a future sentence. Uh, completing large spans of sec sentences within a text. So here you might have a text and you might take out not just one word, but a span of words. Uh, and then, or doing just sort of very noisy, taking out lots of individual words. If you take very various ones of these objectives uh, and then train this model to, to predict those, those words or those missing, miss, missing spans, ultimately the model, the intuition is that the model needs to be quite smart to be able to do those, uh, to do those predictions. And the beautiful thing about this is you can train a, a very large uh, uh, model because you have a large amount of data. Now, the other thing, of course, you need here is a large amount of compute. And so this is why a lot of these foundation models are quite hard to train, often trained on thousands of GPUs for weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months, uh, and cost uh, potentially millions. And uh, you, know, you can even imagine there's some uh, that these models could become even more expensive uh, than that as they scale further up, since the evidence right now is that uh, these larger models continue to get increase their performance uh, as they scale. So that at the core is um, the objective on terms of how these models are trained. These, these foundation models are these foundation models are trained. But there's a few other ideas actually that, that come out come out as well. So that's one idea here in terms of these models, which is self-supervised training. They're trained on a large amount of data with a self self-supervised objective. The other idea, and this is, I think, what was so disruptive about uh, the GPT models, uh, um, is this emergent capability of zero shot, one shot, or few shot learning. So in a traditional, this is an illustration from that, that, that paper. Um, in a traditional fine tuning world, you typically have a data set, which will have, say, let's say, a set, set of you know, reviews, and you'll say, is this a positive or negative uh, review? And you'll show the model those uh, inputs and outputs, and then you'll do it, you know, for your specific tasks that you have, such as, you know, summarization or review, or, or, or review or sentiment classification. And then you'll do a gradient update. You'll move the parameters of the model uh, such that it will be better at predicting your, your, your target. And so that's called, you know, supervised learning. Uh, to find, you know, even if you train an underlying model in a, uh, in a sort of self-supervised way, you would still, if you wanted to solve a particular task, uh, you would fine tune it. And so maybe three or four years ago, uh, there was there was the transformer revolution. There were models like BERT, which were trained in, in, you know, on these large data sets, but were still used in most downstream tasks in a uh, supervised, uh, fine-tuned uh, fine approach. What, what we found is that as these models get larger and larger, we don't actually need to fine tune these models. We can, we can describe in the context of the model, a set of examples, 
And then the, the, the model actually with zero shot, for instance, zero shot would be something like an instruction, for instance, translate English to French, and then it's a cheese, and then it's a fromage or whatever the, the French word for that is. Um, that would be zero shot. So without any example data, just by giving an instruction, right, or a prompt that doesn't that is an example, it will actually be able to complete this task. One shot means maybe give one example, right? So give translate English to French, maybe give an example of this, just so the model says, oh, I get what you're trying to do. Uh, and now it sees the word cheese, it sees sea otter to the, uh, looks for the man, I guess. And then it looks at cheese and it says, okay, what's the right word for French? And it, you can see how given what is shown above, it could learn how to complete what's, uh, um, what's next. Few shot is just another example of that where there's more examples. And typically this performs better and better. If you give you know, one example, two examples, three examples, five examples, the model performs a little bit better. But the intuition here is that their learning is done in context. In context is, means like in the prompt. Um, as, it, as the model is going on a forward pass, it's learning, okay, here's the patterns of completion that, this, uh, that, I'm being, that is being demonstrated to me. And okay, I will complete in a way that's, in a way that's similar. And that contrasts very sharply um, with this idea of, uh, that we need to fine tune the model. And it actually leads to some of the, the most amazing out, uh, result, which is that you, know, you don't need any data to, to use these models. You don't need to train your own model. A single model can you do uh, many, many examples. Um, so there's one other a little bit in terms of if we actually want to understand what how chat GPT uh, works, uh, there's one other little bit, um, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback and I'll talk about that a little bit later so it turns out that um, what I just demonstrated to you was an example of this uh, in the playground where I did the chat uh, example, um, but we can actually go a little bit further so if we really if we want to get a little bit better performance there's other things that we can do which I'll talk about. So what is you know, I guess what's new about this? Uh, so from my perspective, there's really just two things. Um, so one thing is that it's incredibly capable. So it turns out these models uh, do things that, you know, I would say a year ago or two years ago, most folks would think are not possible. Um, and not just in terms of performance on existing tasks that are maybe well-known tasks, you know, sort of deeply subtly understanding uh, sentiment in a review, but also doing fundamentally new tasks, particularly these generative tasks. The idea of, for instance, generating a news article, that was something that was definitely not possible uh, a while ago, or even generating a summary. Maybe that was possible in a kind of a crude way, taking out highlight, you know, key sentences, but this fluid sort of synthesis type of summary that is now possible uh, that you saw, for instance, or, you know, with, when I summarized that abstract and turned it into three bullet points, that really wasn't easily possible. They're certainly not in you know, 10, five, you know, five minutes, which I, or three minutes, which I did uh, for you live. Um, so that gets to the second um, aspect of it, which is that it's also these models, especially due to their zero shot or one shot capabilities are incredibly powerful uh, and incredibly easy. So they open up the ability to actually you uh, think about all the different use cases you could use within your products and then rapidly adopt them. And so, I mean, just to give it a sort of an intuition for, 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 for this, I mean, you know, I, you know, it's sometimes like interesting to sort of just go to a random website and be like, uh, okay, what would, what would happen? You know, what, what, how, what, what could I add to this website? Um, you know, AI features that would actually make this better. And so if I hear, I go to, you know, if I go to uh, Yelp and I, and I say, okay, imagine that I'm trying to build sort of an AI powered Yelp. I'm gonna look for tacos in Oakland, uh, where, which is where I am. I'll look at El Garage, which is, a, it's a pretty great, pretty good place. And well, I look through this and I'll say, oh, I don't know, I don't, what, what is this place? I mean, I see some pictures, that's nice. And then I guess I get some reviews, but wouldn't it be nice just to sort of have like a top level, like, you know, sort of an editorial comment on, on this? Well, you know, no problem. So in this world, you know, in the, in the historical world, a product manager would have to, you know, build up a, a you know, use, this use case and talk to the machine learning engineering team, collect a huge amount of data, do research on how this is possible. In this new world, you can imagine building this type of feature incredibly quickly. So I'm just going to copy and I'm not going to even care about, you know, extracting the text in a nice way. I'm just going to copy and paste from my browser, right? This is uh, really, you should, of course, call your backend APIs, but it doesn't really matter. And so I'm going to say something like, um, uh, so I'll just copy this in. I'll, I'll say something like, I'll just put it, you know, kind of make it clear what's, what's the page and what's not. And I'll say, you know, summarize the following Yelp page and reviews in a short and informative description. So I'm gonna put that at the top of my Yelp page, okay? Then I've got, okay, I decided to use some 
breakers like this. Maybe I should have done something so it understands that's the web page. And then I'll say summary, uh, just so it kind of knows, okay, now I'm supposed to do a summary and let's see if this works, okay? I might have to play around with it a little bit to make it you know, work better, but hey, let's look. Okay, El Garage is a Mexican restaurant located in Richmond, California. Uh, hopefully that's true. Hallucination, I have to check on and see if that's true. Uh, um, offering takeout and delivery, and the menu includes popular dishes such as, and then it lists a set of dishes, et cetera. And then it also some, actually summarizes the reviews that are on the customers rave about the delicious fresh food, generous portions and friendly staff. This re re restaurant is located right across from the Richmond BART, BART station and offers easy street parking. So that's a fantastic review. You can imagine how you could quickly generate for the entire Yelp catalog, these sorts of summaries, maybe update them once a month as new reviews come in. Uh, and then just put that right at the top of the, uh, the, the, the Yelp product here. And boom, you've got a, a, a new feature that might delight your customers um, with very, very little work. And so I think that two, two aspects of that, a new feature fundamentally wasn't previously easy to do, but then also how easy was that? I, mean, I literally solved that problem uh, in a production way. Uh, and I really could productionize that with you know, 10 lines of code potentially uh, uh, in, in, just, in just minutes. And so, you know, put this in next week, we'll, we'll have this new feature uh, in, in, in the product. All right, so um, let's dive a little bit deeper in. So, so, so I, uh, that all looks great. It's, uh, to me, it's extremely exciting um, what these models can do, how easily they can do them, the creativity it unlocks to just say, okay, what else could we do? Could we say most popular dishes, right? I could have just gone there and said, boom, I, now I wanna say more popular dishes, like give me the, Give me the most popular dishes. All I need to do is we change the instruction here and then say, list the four most popular dishes, right? And it will just list it. And then I can put those right up at the, at the, at the top of the website. So incredibly exciting how capable, how easy these models are. All right. For those of you who are out there that have you know, already played a lot with these models, nothing I'm saying is new. Um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into some of the, the existing challenges uh, around using these models. Um, uh, three in particular, um, and then talk about some of the research on ways to fix these things um, and the pros and cons of, of, of sort of these workarounds um, so that you gain an intuition in terms of what's possible, get a kind of seed your uh, mind in terms of thinking about maybe how to, uh, to, how, to, how, to how to navigate some of the more co the, the, the complexities of these use cases. Um, all right, so the first one is uh, LLMs struggle with complex reasoning. So if you're in an application that's doing something like summary summaries or class or classifications, you know maybe even generative, you know sort of small amounts of generative text, uh, you know maybe like the first pass on a blog post. Today's large language models uh, do a do a great job, a remarkable job. But as you start to think about uh, more complex reasoning, uh, that they they don't. Um, the good news is two two things to there, there's really two parts to this. One is we're only at chapter one of these models. Um, and so the, unquestionably these models, uh, the evidence that suggests these models are, are, are gonna get better and better. Some people, you know, I think there's disagreement in terms of you know, how far can they go, but there have been scaling studies that look at uh, given a certain amount of compute, a certain amount of data, a certain number of parameters, um, how does the performance of the models uh, improve? And we're still on a line where the, the performance of these models is significantly improving as we scale. The challenge, of course, is training these models at this scale. Uh, we can talk about this maybe in Q and A. Uh, is becoming quite expensive. So you can you can imagine going from 175 billion parameters, uh, training it on more data. It was probably undertrained on data. So if they had trained that model on enough data for a long enough time, period of time, it would have cost significantly more than maybe the 10 million dollars that it was estimated to train. And if you look at models that maybe are one trillion parameters or 10 trillion parameters, you can even get calculations that today training a 10 trillion parameter model, for instance. Uh, you know, one or two orders of magnitude more than today actually goes into the, you know, mid billions of dollars in, in, in training costs. So um, if performance continues to increase, uh, uh, it's going to be quite costly to train these large models. So given that, um, there's always going to be this need for, given the current models, can we kind of get good performance? And a lot of that, I think, is today is around prompt engineering. Can you generate new prompts? Um, we saw you can do zero shot instruction prompts. Uh, you can do one, you can show some examples. Um, really, it's about experimenting. A lot of uh, today's, uh, if you're caring about performance, today's work is around uh, doing uh, prompt engineering, which is experimenting with good, good prompts. Um, two kind of interesting ideas here in terms of the specific challenge around complex reasoning are, um, one is chain of, of, of thought prompting. 
So chain of thought prompting rec says, rather than giving a, a simple example where you might say, uh, you know, here's a, you know, here's a complicated, uh, you know, uh, uh, problem. In this particular case, it's something like, you know, Roger has five tennis balls and he buys two more cans of tennis balls. Each one has three tennis balls. How many tennis balls does he have now? Uh, you know, it's kind of a contrived example, but it has a lot of prological reasoning. Um, you know, if you just ask that in a zero shot fashion or a one shot fashion, you know, these models perform okay, but they often give uh, the wrong result. So in this, in this uh, particular case, you know, this is a one shot standard prompt. So here's the ex example with an example answer. Uh, and then down here, we say the cafeteria has 23 prompts. This is what we're actually asking and it gets, gets this particular one wrong. So in this, in this, with chain of thought prompting, the re recognition is if you give an example that actually explains the reasoning around your, you know, around your process. So in this case, it's saying the, the example answer that we're giving it, the one shot prompt that we're giving it includes the chain of thought that you gave to, to, to arrive at your conclusion. And so you said, Roger started with five balls, two cans of three tennis balls, each is six tennis balls, five plus six equals 11, the answer is 11. So I kind of went step by step through that, and then it asks another question. And then what you see is the model learns that it should give an answer that, that follows this chain of, of thought, and it, and, it, and it explains its chains of thought. It allows it to decompose the problem. So here it says, you know, cafeteria has 23 apples. If they use 20 apples to make lunch and bought six more, how many apples do they have? And the model says the cafeteria has 23 apples originally, so it's summarizing it. They used 20 to make lunch, okay. So they have 23 minus 20, which is three. They bought six more apples. So they have three plus six equals nine. The answer is nine. And you can see how the model is starting to decompose the problem. It's sort of you know, tracking that on a scratch pad, if you will, which is the text that it's writing out and it still has access to. And then as it completes, uh, the answer can kind of go look back at those intermediate answers that it gave. And it does a remarkably uh, a better result. Um, and so this, if you're, if you're working on a case or you're not getting the performance that you want, I think one thing to do is to think about explain your reasoning. So even with things like summarization, you can say, maybe you give an example where here's an example and maybe you say, uh, you know, let me think about what the user might want. The user wants to know where this is located, what customers are saying, right? And you sort of explain, and then you say the customers are saying this, and you could explain that. And from that prompt, which explains your thought process, it will then copy that, generate its thought process, and generate potentially a much more coherent result. You can think about it for long form text, maybe you should generate an out, outline first. When you say generate a blog post, maybe your example should say, first, let me you know, you know, generate an outline. I think the top three points are this. Now, let me write section one. Section one is this. Now, let me write section two. Section two is this. And that actually will be a better uh, completion, more logically structured completion than a completion that just um, <clears throat> goes from, hey, generate a blog post on, on generative AI, right? Um, if you give it, a, that, that maybe is, a, you know, it needs some intermediate uh, sort of scratch pad where it can first generate an outline. Um, even if before you go into formal chaining, which we'll talk about, uh, even just in this context, um, allowing it to uh, have a chain of thought uh, leads to significantly better performance. And we've seen that on a number of examples and the research definitely shows this. Um, there's other versions of this. This is an, oh, <clears throat> what would you call one shot chain of thought. Uh, one shot means I give you one example of a, of a person having a chain of thought. Um, what's remarkable is that you can actually, uh, this is sort of a, you know, you can actually do this in zero shots. So there's a paper here called Lar Large Language Models are Zero Shot Reasoners. Um, the reasoners uh, here is the fact that it will generate reasoning. And so, and there was this observation uh, in this paper that if you simply you know, ask a question, right? This is a similar type of question that we was just on the previous page. And then you simply prepend, you add to the, the answer, but right before you say, let's think step by step. That alone, that little phrase, let's think step by step is enough to cause this model to de start to think step by step by step and decompose the problem, which ultimately will significantly improve uh, its, um, its performance. The intuition here, you know, you can, I, I think about two ways. One is it's giving this, this model a little bit of a scratch pad where it can write down intermediate work and then look at it back because every time it's completing a new word, it can always look back and attend to what it's previously done. Or you can think of it as in some ways telling the model to allocate more computation to this problem. Rather than in a simple case, you say, if it's just to give me the answer, it's got one time where it can just, you know, make one cal calculation and boom, you know, using that 175 billion parameters and the forward pass, it hasn't generate the answer. 
In, in this case where you're allowing it to maybe generate a more long-winded answer, thinking step by step, it's also allocating more computation. So first it's allocating computation to think, decomposing the problem, then it's allocation to answering subparts of the problem. And finally, it's allocating um, uh, uh, computation to the, 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 the actual final answer. Um, so this is just, you know, I think one lesson here is absolutely don't uh, sort of, uh, you know, put your first prompt in and get a result and say, hey, I'm not satisfied. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of creativity that you can apply to your prompts, and these can have dramatic impacts uh, for sp specifically for specific types of problems, these more complicated uh, reasoning type problems, um, where you can significantly improve, improve the performance of your models. And so just, you know, as you're thinking about your own application, I think there's some pros and cons. So pros in this case, um, a, prop, a prompt engineering, because we'll talk about some other approaches uh, in a second, um, extremely flexible much more flexible than you would originally think so not only can you do a tremendous amount of tasks you can do things like uh you know classification you can do translation summarization uh generative uh, text you know anything you you know anything you want really um anything that you can create a human uh, written instruction for uh, you can do and then you can often even increase your performance um by being clever doing things like writing better prompts being more specific specific about what you want giving examples giving examples and searching an example database for instance for examples that are similar to the question that you have right so if it's summarized this document that document happens to be uh you know a news article versus a research article maybe give the examples that you have in a few shot prompt maybe make those examples similar for you know for a news article or for a research paper and so if you create a lot of examples you know there's, there's ways where you can look up for similar examples uh, and then put those into the prompt that turns out to help a lot maybe allow the model to spend more computation by allowing it to think step by step or decomposing the problem even before getting into chaining even just with respect to a prompt that allows it to generate sort of a more long-winded answer that can significantly uh, improve uh, improve the performance. Um, so the other pros of I think of prompt engineering, it's very fast to get an initial working benchmark. Um, there's no training, there's no data, there's no training. Um, so as you saw, I just implement use cases, you know, in seconds. Um, very simple deployment. So there's no fine tuned model to deploy. There's uh, you know all you really have is a prompt uh, and then it's com a completion. So it's incredibly simple to deploy. Maybe you know you start to as you scale, you start to extract the prompt. Maybe put it in a database allow yourself uh, to kind of quickly iterate on those, maybe um, even A-B test them. Uh, and so there's a lot uh, you can do there in terms of your workflow around prompt management, um, you know, A-B testing your prompts, uh, if there is a clear feedback signal, um, uh, and iterating on those prompts or creating example example databases and then doing smart things like finding similar examples. But in all of those cases, it's, it's you know, very simple, much simpler, for instance, than fine tuning a, a, a model. And I think another one is uh, about uh, uh, about prompt engineering is that it's also privacy preserving. And by that, that I mean, you can put customer data into the prompt and not have to worry about that customer data. For instance, the email of the customer, you don't have to worry about that email of the customer uh, uh, leaking into the actual model itself and then being shared across across your uh, across your customers. So there's no customer data in the model parameter, uh, parameters and it allows you to personalize your model um uh you know for instance the style of the person's email responses you can have some examples of it pulled from their thing and not have to worry about hey i have, I have a personalized email response you know responder but not actually have to worry about the, the data leakage concerns it's just a hard line you're not going to data leak if you're doing it uh in if you're not doing gradient updates um the cons are that prompting can be a dark art so you're kind of fiddling with the, these prompts and you're kind of experimenting with them um, and you know, little things like step by step, you know, things step by step can make a huge difference. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, make, can make a huge difference. Um, the prompting context length is limited, so this becomes particularly true when you're when you're generating uh, when you when you have uh, a lot of sort of third party data that you're injecting into the prompt, such as the summary of a web page. Um, And future, uh, what, I'm just looking at, uh, uh, I, I would say a, a last one that I would say I would be very aware of would be that future models may very well make all of this work irrelevant. And so you, this is, I think, less of a concern for prompt engineering, uh, unless because it's easy to do. Um, but I would say this search for performance via prompt engineering may be, not be the best use of time because larger models are unquestionably coming out and maybe you should uh, sort of focus on other things. So. That's prompt engineering, probably you know the bread and butter of, of these models. Let's talk about a few other challenges and some more advanced use cases. So, 
Um, a second problem is that uh, you know LLMs are not aligned with our goals. And aligned is a term that's used in this world a lot. But this really means that although I'm generating this instruction like summarize this uh, web page or summarize this, this set of product reviews, what exactly type of summary do I want, right? What do I prefer, this versus that, right? When I was generating that chatbot, um, I gave I could generate a quick and dirty chatbot, but there's lots of different types of responses. There's funny responses, long responses, responses for you know grade schoolers versus uh, domain experts. Um, uh, there's there's you know there's safety concerns like you know should it be able to do certain things like generate uh, you know uh, w w ways to do objectionable generate objectionable ob objectionable content. That might be a policy that you have internally that you want to protect against. And so LLMs are not inherently aligned with our goals. And a huge amount of research, research is going into how do I align goals. And so there's a bunch of uh, ideas here um, that you should just be aware of. Um, these are much harder to uh, implement, um, but they've, they've, we've seen um, both with respect to chat GPT uh, and with respect to the earlier instruction fine-tuned models, which are these models actually that I was just demonstrating in the OpenAI playground, that we do need more advanced ways to train these models simply than this sort of pre-training approaches that I've talked about. So the the, the real, the, these models became, um, the open AI models became much, much better once they adopted this approach of what's called human reinforcement learning with human uh, feedback. And I'll describe that in a second. The net result of this paper, if you wanna read about, um, this, this paper is training uh, language models to follow instructions with human feedback. And the recognition here was this general idea of completing text uh, is not a great objective, right? Um, because it's simply saying, okay, I've got some, I've got some prompt. That prompt is not an instruction. That prompt is something that you know, in, in this just purely self-supervised way, would be something that showed up on the web, and well, who knows what it would respond to, right? Um, there's not a lot of like instructions and then completions uh, on the web. It mostly just is uh, sort of random stuff. And so what uh, this paper did is it said, let's try to tune these models, fine tune these models in a way such that we assume the prompt is an instruction, a human instruction of, I want you to do this, like, you know, generate a blog on, uh, you know, uh, generative AI, right? That's an instruction, summarize a blog on this. That's an instruction. A self-supervised objective may, if you think summarize, a, you know, uh, uh, this, 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 this news article, you could imagine it actually just say another news article that summarized this news article. It doesn't actually give you the result, right? That could be the kind of data that it was trained on. And so we need to you know, tune these models to follow instructions. So this idea of following instructions or tuning models to follow instructions, instruction tune models, uh, turned out to radically improve user satisfaction of these models. And so this particular paper talks about uh, OpenAI's instruction tune model and the methods they use to do that, which, are, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback. And they found that a much smaller model, a 1.3 billion parameter uh, instruct GPT model uh, was actually preferred over the raw 175 billion GPT-3 model. And so since then, of course, they've you know, also instruction tuned the large model. Uh, and that's really why uh, OpenAI's models uh, for many use cases still, uh, these or these instruction tuned models are still uh, much preferred on a human base in terms of human interaction. Um, uh, that, that, uh, than just these, uh, these self-supervised models so that, or models that are purely just self-supervised. Um, it was off, also used to train chat GPT, so this general method. Um, uh, if you look at the, the blog post, they'll describe a little bit about for chat GPT, how they tuned these models, not just to follow instructions, but actually to um, do, do dialogue-based applications. So what are dialogue-based applications? I mean, or, how, or sorry, so how does, how does uh, this, this, this fine-tuning process work? Um, there's really three uh, sort of, uh, uh, th three main steps. Um, so one is, first of all, you create some examples uh, and fine-tune a model. This is, this is uh, similar to the, the simple fine-tuning. You say, hey, let me generate a bunch of instructions and completions, and let me fine-tune this model first to generate a base model that's fine-tuned uh, for, uh, for this goal of following instructions. The twist around reinforcement learning is to say, then subsequently, let me generate a set of compares, a set of multiple different outputs for a prompt. So you say, give me a blog on uh, generative AI, generate blog one, blog two, then collect human feedback. So that's the human feedback component, where do you prefer answer A or answer B? Now, rather than just use that and then do a supervised uh, fine tuning, which you could, right, you could take the better uh, uh, output and then go and just uh, do normal fine tuning. That's relatively easy to do, even you know with OpenAI's APIs. 
what OpenAI found was that it's actually better to learn the preferences of the user. And so you build an intermediate sort of surrogate model of the preferences of the user. What do users like? Do they like this type of post or this type of post? You can actually generate a model that given any two responses, will say, I think the user would prefer this or, or this. And this, this is called PPO or proximal policy optimization, where that's where, where this is the reward, the reward model, a part of that algorithm. And then in the final step, which is the reinforcement learning step, you update your model based on the signals that you're getting from this reward model. So you show the reward model, multiple examples, that reward model gives you a reward. And then in using a reinforcement learning type algorithm, you propagate those, uh, th those reward signals back to update the, uh, the, the parameters of your model. Now, this turns out to actually do better than supervised fine tuning, or at least that's what you know, they, 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 they seem to find. Um, uh, but it is a, a considerable amount of work um, to do. There, there are some other, this is a very powerful idea, and I just want to quickly point out uh, sort of two other, um, you know, papers that I think are interesting um, uh, in, in this regard. So one is a paper from Anthropic. Uh, so a, a challenge with uh, this approach is that there's a lot of human oversight needed. Um, so there's a lot of human oversight to generate these initial examples, and there's a lot of human oversight needed to generate these comparisons. This whole human oversight could be costly because, for instance, reading an entire blog post and deciding which one you want is actually a time consuming activity. And so, um, Anthropic, which is a number of ex OpenAI uh, researchers who have a new company here, has a paper which they call Constitutional AI. And they demonstrate actually that there's ways for models to provide feedback uh, for, for, for themselves. And so, you can actually cause the, in terms of uh, building up uh, this reward model you can actually have the AI critique the responses uh, based on some constitutional principles. And so in their case, they show how you can uh, make these uh, models more harmless, less, less toxic by setting up some constitutional principles or principles that you want these, these, uh, these models to follow. And then having the, the model actually critique the responses uh, based on those principles and then uh, build, build a reward model based on that and then fine tune this process and then go into this iterative sort of reinforcement loop here. So I'm going to skip, uh, given the time, I'm going to sort of skip over the details of this. I just want to, you know, if you are interested in reinforcement learning uh, for human feedback, I would really encourage you to also read this constitutional AI paper. I think it's uh, really uh, a promising research direction where you can have these models self-improve. Self there's other things to be aware of, other approaches to be aware of here that you should also be, uh, be aware of. Reinforcement learning is, is a tricky currently. I think this is going to get much easier in the, in the next year in terms of there'll be, exist, there'll be tools out there that will help make this easier. Um, but it's not the only way. So you can, for instance, do uh, supervised fine tuning. Uh, Google has a paper uh, on scaling instruction fine tuning models where they figure out different creative ways to generate huge numbers of uh, uh, of sort of instruction output uh, pairs using all sorts of di uh, different existing data sets and sort of reformulating them into that uh, modality. And I would say if you have something like this, you know, there may be creative ways to do data generation and then with those sort of, you know, uh, automated data generation processes, fine tune a model and, and get uh, much better results as, as, a re as, as a result of that fine tuning. There's one final paper that uh, I'll, I'll point out to here is that fine tuning may or may not be the future. Um, and so there's a very interesting paper uh, on prompt tuning, um, uh, which is the idea of why do we have to actually uh, guide these models using the prompt uh, in text format? Why can't we guide it using sort of a soft prompt in latent space? And so this particular paper actually finds that as these models get larger and larger, uh, this idea of prompt tuning or, or tuning your prompt in a in latent space, which kind of gives you more flexibility, um, actually can converge to a fine tuning result um, as the models get larger and larger. And that actually kind of can matches maybe your intuition, which as these models get larger, you can think of them being more capable of more tasks. They just need to understand what you're trying to achieve. And so you don't actually need to update their parameters of the model. Maybe you can actually just be very careful about prompting. So it's, you know, I think prompt tuning is sort of like, uh, prompt engineering on superpowers, where it's you're getting a more structured approach uh, to, 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 to prompt tuning. So again, pros and cons of these various, these various uh, approaches. Um, fine tuning and instruction fine tuning, very powerful alignment tool. tool. Um, I think there's evidence here, which we cannot overlook, that instruct GPT from OpenAI, chat GPT, both were fine tuned uh, reinforcement learning, you know, uh, 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 with human feedback versions of fine tuned models that sort of had a disruptive quality improvement in terms of people's perceptions and really allowed those models to 
uh, you know, not be, there's not really a competitive alternative than currently in the open source world, uh, or even from other uh, companies in terms of public APIs. I think a lot of that is actually due not to the scale of the model, but really due to the uh, due, due to this careful attention to uh, making these models useful uh, through human feedback. Um, uh, you know, fine tuning has some other benefits. You know, a lot of times you can, for simple use cases, you can fine tune smaller models uh, and get the performance of bigger models. So if you're in a, 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 an application domain that's latency sensitive or cost sensitive, fine tuning can be a tremendous uh, way to, to solve those problems. There are some real cons. Uh, so fine tuning requires labels. It's a lot more work than prompt engineering. Um, reinforcement learning approaches, while very powerful, are not currently easy to implement. So there's not sort of off the shelf uh, sort of solutions that are you know, sort of fully robust and have been kind of proven, um, you know, outside of some of these papers. Um, uh, it's actually often hard to evaluate the quality. Uh, so human feedback is also even hard for many use cases, right? So if you have really long uh, documents or books and you're trying to generate summaries, that's just a hard task for a human to do. And so it can be quite costly. Uh, or time consuming uh, to do it. And you can also often only get to the performance level of uh, your labelers, which may not be the expert level labelers that you would, that you would want. Um, fine tuning models can be more expensive uh, from an inference perspective if you're using a solution like OpenAI. Um, and then finally, I think one that is very important but often overlooked is fine tuning introduces all sorts of data privacy concerns. And so often you wanna fine tune your model on customer data like their emails, but that just simply isn't possible, right? So uh, without real risk of, of, of leaking that data into the parameters of the model and then exposing them. And there is a lot of research that shows that uh, that can happen. And so, you know, certainly do not, uh, you know, train your models uh, on, 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 on data that you don't ultimately wouldn't be okay with uh, leaking in some, in, in some respects. The, f the final one uh, that I wanna talk about in the, in the sort of the last, uh, you know, five minutes, um, is that L the problem that I think often happens is that LLMs don't know lots of stuff and they make stuff, uh, they make a lot of stuff up. And um, the, the most dominant way, and I think this is actually one of the most promising areas for applications, um, is to do what is called search augmentation or tool augmentation of these models and to recognize that these models can be sort of the brain, but there's no reason we, we should, maybe we can build uh, more powerful models more models that are more grounded in the in truth, right? Uh, that understand uh, data that might be proprietary to you, that can use tools, call APIs. Um, and so there's a number of papers here um, that, that I think I if I were looking at this space that I would wanna read. Um, one is Retro uh, from DeepMind, uh, which basically uh, finds that if you create a search index uh, for, for your you know, set of use cases, and there's lots of examples of how to do this online, um, you can augment the prompt dynamically uh, with uh, snippets of context that are from your search index and have the uh, language model be aware of that, uh, that context or have it be in the prompt and then can attend to that, that while it's giving the answer. And so it, this is you know, uh, a great way to add private data to model, models in a scalable way. And I think also it's a, a, a fantastic approach because it's uh, privacy preserving. So you can, get, you can scale it way up in terms of you can have a ton of private data um, and, and still make it feasible while also not leaking that into the, to the model parameters. Um, two other papers that are kind of, you know, uh, that are often cited in this area is uh, OpenAI has a paper called WebGPT, which is really, I think you can, if you look at Bing and the new announcements between Bing and OpenAI is really what's going on behind Bing. They talk about uh, 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 basically a fine-tuned model that's uh, very good at using web search uh, along with uh, the large language model to combine the best of both those worlds. Um, and uh, then there's a new paper out um, just a couple of days ago from uh, Meta uh, called Toolformer, which says, look, we don't have to just, these tools don't have to just be search. They can actually be uh, all sorts of tools. These, the, how we use those tools can actually be, we can let the large language model itself decide when it needs to do a tool. And so through a combination of sort of fine tuning and very smart uh, you know, formatting, um, you can basically cause the model to, when it thinks a tool would be useful, it basically will go and call out a function call and then bring whatever the result is here. Uh, they, they show an example of a few different tools like QA tools and calculator tools. It will bring the result back uh, into the context and then uh, generate an answer. And so um, I think, in, you know, from my perspective, you know, prompt engineering, uh, you know, probably your, your base skill, this idea of retrieval augmentation, tool use, and prompt chaining is probably the most useful things uh, for people building products today. Uh, in terms of it's something you can easily get started with. It's not too hard once you get the hang of it. 
Um, uh, and it, it really expands the, the capability set of these models and also uh, grounds it in whatever domain you're operating it, it with and the tools and the resources and data resources that you have. So pros, extremely easy. Uh, still a little bit more complicated than just basic prompt engineering, but not hard. Um, tie to your existing models, preserve your privacy of your user, you know, uh, users, and allows you to sort of decompose uh, more complicated tasks into more fine-grained tasks so try to get uh, uh, work around some of the limitations of today's uh, foundation models. Um, it can be, you know, I think some of the downsides are, you know, it is more complicated. Um, you know, it can slow things down. So chaining multiple function calls together, if you're in a latency sensitive application, actually can be uh, degrade the user experience per, per, uh, particularly. But if you're in a batch environment where maybe you're pre computing some of the, the end results, um, this can be a very, very powerful way to do it. Um, these or auto, you know, you're automating some workflows that aren't uh, latency uh, latency sensitive. Um, so there's, you know, that was just a kind of a brief overview of some challenges and sort of a, kind of a tour of some of the solutions to that or ways to, to improve it. Hopefully, it really inspires you to think of your own uh, solutions or to kind of look at the literature for what other people are doing. Um, a lot of these are very accessible, um, I think, but with the exception of the reinforcement learning with human feedback. Uh, these are things that, you know, can be done, you know, an engineer can do them in a couple of days and kind of experiment with them. And so it's sort of the to-do app, you know, even uh, a, a, a large language models is to hook up, for instance, a search index with uh, the large language model. And so um, I think that's, uh, uh, those are um, uh, easy ones to get started with and you can take them quite far. Um, what's, you know, just to conclude out, I want to talk about kind of two other uh, areas, which is, you know, everybody says, well, what's next? What, what do you think is coming? And then sort of where are the most promising applications for this uh, within your own businesses? And so in terms of what's next, um, I think you're going to see a, a, you know, these four kind of main, main thrusts. One is models are going to become multimodal. So they're not, today's models are great with uh, text. They're getting great with images. Uh, I think you're going to see these, these modalities mixed um, and, and all sorts of creative new on, uh, applications potentially unlocked as a result. The models are going to get much better. Um, and so all the evidence here um, is that we have not reached a sort of a, a plateau in terms of model performance, even using with today's uh, tech techniques. So even just they're saying there's no sort of scientific advancement in terms of the model itself, um, just scaling them, uh, making them more efficient, um, training them on more data. With more compute, it, the evidence seems to suggest that these models are going to get much more capable. I think alignment also is going to uh, having these models better aligned is going to also make them much more useful, and so they're going to appear to be much more capable from a from a from, a, from an actual practical perspective. Um, models today don't learn continuously. I think this is going to change. There's various ways this can happen, but I think this idea that, uh, that models are continually absorbing information will happen. Um, that, that's relatively straightforward to think about various ways that that could happen. Um, and then a final one, which I think is very important for practical usage, is these models will become more steerable. And so by steerable, I mean, it'll be easier to align them with the what we're, our, our goals are. And uh, this actually is just, it's not an academic uh, concern. It actually really leads to like a fundamentally different quality experience for the product. Um, you know, a blog post, you know, it can be magical the first moment when you generate a blog post, but then if you look at it and it's actually not that insightful and it's kind of uh, generic or just a very bland style, um, you know, that, that initial sort of enthusiasm may wane. Um, I think that's going to change. You'll be able to think, guide them to your style, uh, you know, allow them to be uh, much more coherent, insightful, et cetera. Um, uh, and so that will, uh, I think that will happen. happen. Um, in terms of promising product areas, um, you know, I think there's, there's, there's again, kind of four ways that I, that I think, or we've, when we talk to customers and, and, and I talk to people who are thinking about this sort of thing, there, there's ideas and they're talking about the various ideas they're having. Without talking about the specifics ideas, I think there's like, you know, four kind of areas where you can think of. Um, there are brand new categories of products that are going to be built. Um, these are capabilities that previously didn't exist, and we're going to have new products. Mobile came and Uber, you know, think about the huge winners. Some of the huge winners were new categories, things like Uber, things that weren't, uh, or DoorDash, you know, Instacart, things that weren't kind of previously possible or weren't, you know, enjoyable, certainly, uh, without the sort of the mobile, the mobile experience. Um, and so I think there's going to be a ton of, a ton of that, um, a lot of it in the creative domain, for sure. Thank you, Copi. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to do a quick uh, time check because we're we're at the hour. And in case some folks have to go, um, we saw your questions come in. So definitely noting those down and we'll follow up with you. And Tristan, you can go ahead and continue. But I just wanted to make sure that folks know we, we will answer their questions and follow up. And I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Bethann. Um, I apologize for rushing through this, everybody. Um, I'm almost, I'm, I think I have one more slide. 
or two more slides. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up real quick. And maybe if there is an exciting question, I'll, then I'll grab um, for those are for folks that are sticking around. Um, so uh, you have category creators. I think we have co-pilot products. So GitHub Copilot is an example of this. These are products that sit side by side with your everyday workflow. I think there's category disruptors. So all the existing categories of products from CRMs to search um, have the potential to be disrupted by sort of fundamentally new product experiences. Um, you know, Bing and Bing uh, uh, is new to new Bing is an example of that trying to disrupt search. Um, and then I think there's, of course, every product is going to be AI enhanced uh, or, AI, or add AI features. And so, you know, Hex, uh, a great product in the data space, just for instance, add a number of amazing features with respect to uh, them kind of adding AI features to their existing product. Um, I think that where's all this going to lead? I think, you know, this prediction from Sam Altman is pretty, uh, I would agree with um, that the, the capability of these models is going to get tremendously uh, strong, very, very fast, a faster than I think we think. And um, that's certainly what's happened over the last year. But it's going to take a lot of creativity, a lot of work to actually embed them into all the product experiences uh, and the products that we have. Uh, and so that's been our experience uh, translating it uh, from the model and the capability into a product, even if it's easy, still requires a lot of creativity to think about how can I actually change the workflows and improve the uh, deliver business value uh, uh, to, to end users. And so that's probably going to take a longer than we anticipate. Um, so with that, uh, very exciting times. Uh, we'll look for the questions and follow up uh, for, for folks on, on questions. Um, and yeah, why don't I, uh, Beth Ann, if there is one question that jumps out at you, I'm happy to take it right now, or we can follow up uh, async. Yeah, and I, I think our our folks are still online. So first from Bradley. Hey, Bradley, good to have you here. Um, interesting idea on using LLMs to do A-B testing on your prompts. Could you perhaps show a quick example of that? Um, well, I probably can't. Uh, I probably can't show a quick, quick example, but but in terms of you know, I think that the general idea would be that you have multiple prompts, uh, and so you're wondering which prompt is better uh, to you know going to give you a better result, right? So if you're thinking about like generating a review, a review summary, which prompt, and you have various ways to write it, maybe with like few shot prompts, zero shot prompts, uh, prompts with lots of principles embedded into that. Um, you need to figure out how to how to say whether that's better. Now, in some cases, that might be you know, you just looking at the results and, and making a judgment. In some cases, if you do have the ability to have product feedback, right? So you have engagement data, you could you could A-B test those, right? You could say, okay, here's prompt one. You could use an A-B testing tool. Here's prompt one, here's the result that it generated. Here's prompt two, here's the result that it generated. And use a traditional A-B testing tool to look at uh, those two results. Um, you can take this a little bit further where you can actually have the AI generate prompts. So you can say, for instance, like here's prompt one, you know, here's a set of prompts. Uh, and then you can say, generate some additional prompts that are similar. That, and you can even say, generate some prompts that will lead to high engagement. Now, whether the AI, you know, these large models are capable of generating great prompts, you know, is an empirical question. Um, but there is some work if you search for, for instance, automated prompt engineering, uh, examples of where, uh, you know, you're actually using the AI to generate prompt candidates. I think then the question becomes, well, how do you get that feedback back to say, is this prompt better or worse? You know, do you want to just send it out to a labeling workforce where you get the feedback from, from paid labelers, or can you actually get product feedback, right? So maybe you have a search page result and you're generating little snippets and you can generate you know, multiple versions of that snippets from different prompts. You inject that into your search page result and then you look at which ones do they click on, right? Which ones, you know, which ones lead to higher click-through rates or lower bounce back rates? You know, if you click and then you bounce back, that's sort of an implicit feedback in terms of the quality of, you know, did the user get what they expect? And you can feed those back in and then make a decision on, okay, I want to use uh, this, this particular prompt. Taking that even further, I think it's exciting is can you actually like learn from that and then generate, you know, do prompt tuning based on those signals, right? Where it, that's a little bit hard uh, in sort of the discrete space of text. Um, and so I don't think I've seen a paper that does that. Uh, sort of really closes that loop um, uh, uh, fully, you know, in a non-AB testing kind of format. Um, but I think you can get pretty far with, with A-B testing. Thank you, Tristan. Great. Well, I think uh, just to be respectful of everybody's calendar, we can wrap it here. And I have noted down the, the rest of the questions. So I know that Tristan, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look forward to following up with you guys one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and so much appreciate everybody joining us today. And again, you'll, um, you'll get the replay in your inbox and we look forward to connecting with you soon. Thanks everybody.